So we are starting the second part, and I hope you can hear me on the background of the disruptive sound atmosphere here. Um, or maybe some people want to come in. Um, so th the second part we want to do on, on uh, disruptive networks and get more to the uh, idea of disruption as opposed to uh, sustainability and it's going to be very much uh, kind of different takes on symbolic economies and uh, to to discuss this we, we have uh, brought here uh, Alexander Müller who is kind of representing the Epicurean hedonism uh, coming from uh, the Berlin German background and to kind of create some tension and uh, constructive disruption we brought in from, actually not we, but the Willem Flusser archive and the Transmediale brought in some uh, more theory-based uh, look and take on uh, symbolic economies from Greece. So we think this is kind of a good uh, statement on the current European situation, kind of turned upside down and uh, disrupted, hopefully in a creative way. Um, so Alexander is going to start with presenting some of the work uh, around uh, the Hedonist International and kind of the hijacking, uh, PR hijacking approach. And um, after that we're going to directly move over to Georgios um, giving some kind of more uh, theoretically economical, he, he, he promised us some economic, economical theory here, uh, some comments on that, and then we'll try to reconcile or not reconcile those two perspectives. Uh, oh, it works. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Hedonist International is a, um, a loose cluster of, of people that are interested in mainly um, enjoying life and um, making the world a better place. So would I think it's a, a group of, of different media and political activists. Um, so, so the name with the hedonism in there is not really apolitical, it's rather highly political. So we, we do parties, we do demonstrations, and we do everything to show that we are not careless hedonists, which was one of the um, big um, uh, problems people had with uh, the upcoming youth in the uh, beginning of 2000, of the 2000 years, um, that you know they, they didn't care anymore. So uh, we kind of uh, protest that opinion. And of course, if you protest, uh, what you're trying to do is you, you usually show that you're not happy with the way uh, that things are going. So like you could start out with something like this. You know, you protest. Um, you can uh, do more um, paramilitary approaches with a piece of bread. Um, you can actually attack people, but the uh, thing about protests is uh, they can also attack you. This is a very famous uh, picture of last year of an old man in Stuttgart uh, trying to protest the um, uh, establishment of a new uh, railway station, and he got um, blinded actually by a um, water gun. Um, so so this, this way of protest, you know, seems to be fun to some people, but um, really it, it doesn't really seem to be that sustainable. And the problem with, with classical protest is its reactiveness. Um, you basically accept the agenda and um, only very few times you're actually able to set the agenda and, uh, agenda and change it. So uh, this is not what we do. Um, I think one, one thing you have to keep in mind is that politics is plain crazy. It's not like there's any com common consensus or anything rational about politics. Um, and like with any mental institution, if you take it serious, you're going to be unhappy. Um, so in Germany, we say if, if, even if you strive against the stream, you're still swimming in the stream. So... Um, so we, we've come to believe that ridiculing politics uh, does not take the seriousness out of it, it puts it back in there. Um, so, and that is because, w like every societal product, um, not only politics, um, works only if, if we take it serious. 
So if you want to deconstruct something, you better start by not taking it serious. Um, so that's probably the, the hardest attack you can play. Hard both in if it works, it's really a tough one. Um, and also hard as in it's hard to do this. So we, we go by a, a idealized uh, easy model of um, how uh, politics in Western societies uh, works. And um, you try to um, basically wherever there is an arrow you can hack. Um, you can hack the system and try to influence the way uh, things are going. Um, I've had a longer talk on this on the 28th uh, Congress of the Chaos Computer Club, so whoever is interested in, in this uh, can, can watch it there. Today I'm going to try to keep it short and just show you some of the things that people in the area of Hedonist International have done. For example, um, luxury apartments for rent in Berlin, and you know you can go there uh, to uh, visit the walkthrough of those uh, luxury apartments, you enter, you get naked. You can't probably see that because it's too much light, but the people are actually naked in these pictures. Um, and you dance, so you have a party. And uh, you gain media attention to the problem of, of rising rents in uh, Berlin. Um, one thing about nakedness is it always works. This was really uh, a big thing in media. Um, and nakedness, well, pun intended, doesn't wear off. Uh, you, can, you can always do this. You, the media is always going to be there for you. As long as you're naked, you got it. Um, no, it's really like easy, easy, easy way to do. But it's also a helpful. Um, I think it was invented basically something like 20 years ago at a demonstration in Göttingen uh, against some, some, some right-wing military idiots. Um, and the protesters were all naked. And th there was a, a police line trying to um, separate those, those right-wing guys from the, from the student protesters. And it's, it's always very tough to cross a, a police barrier. Y you, know, you can practice this at, at G8 summits. Uh, you, you, know, you have different tactics to, to, to actually get through a police barrier. But probably the, the most effective one was uh, what those guys did 20 years ago in Göttingen. They just went naked. And they walked right through. And the police do, did nothing. I guess this only works once. But um, the second time, when it doesn't work, you have the pictures of policemen beating up a naked person. And, you know, that's, and then you have the media again. And so nakedness always works. Um, another thing that was in 2003, I think it wasn't even called Hedonist International at the time, was the demonstration for more war. You know, we were already at war uh, with Afghanistan, and the, the uh, Iraq was, uh, was getting attacked. So there was a big demonstration in, in Berlin for more war. Yeah. Um, and everybody came in military outfits and, you know, with, like, f tanks and, and cheered for, like, hooray for more war. Um, Another one, a very nice thing uh, that I, that I, one of my favorite things was the, a media hack. So we sent a, a, a fake protagonist to a um, German media show that is now discontinued, was called Polylux. And they, they, pay, they posted in an internet forum, yeah, uh, we're looking for someone um, who's, on a, uh, who's using drugs in his like, normal life, using speed to get along or cocaine to, to study or whatever. So um, somebody <laughs> called up there and said, yeah, well, um, I am on a speed diet. And speed diet as in um, speed diet, trying to lose weight by uh, consuming lots of speed. Uh, so we had a 170-kilogram uh, person um, who, who had a, uh, you know, was quite nervous and smoking five joints a day to keep the nervousness down, um, but uh, had less appetite and was actually losing weight because they consumed a lot of speed. And uh, Tita von Hardenbeck with Polylux um, really sent the report on, on TV. And as soon as the episode was aired, uh, Hedonist International claimed responsibility and um, um, basically criticized their um, methods of, of research and the, basically the bullshit that they, that they aired. Um, another thing we did was we... Uh, I, I usually call this the uh, the voluntary social media um, 
like like the 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 voluntary social media um, bureau for certain uh, institutions, for example, the German um, nuclear lobby. So they they suddenly had a very uh, successful Twitter account that was operated by people who actually belonged to the Hedonist International and was uh, very cynical and uh, satirical about the dangers of nuclear energy. Um, so the actual the, the the lobbyist organization announced that they would take legal action, and at that time you've always won, yeah, right? So you're you're in every newspaper in, on any, every website, you're the satire that you know they are trying to censor, right? So you, so you brought a lot of attention to that to that case. Um, you can also do it more sub subtle. I mean, this is always like you know, oh, they're trying to censor us, it, you know. It's also one of those that always works, but you know it's not really that interesting. It's more interesting to be the German Minister of the Interior, uh, who is uh, Islamophobic uh, beyond any doubt, and was then twittering from uh, an Islam conference. Um, and you know, as we started, as we started this this Twitter account, um, actually the 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 real Minister of Families in Germany gave the account credibility by acknowledging its uh, existence. So we had a lot of followers on, on Twitter um, for a short while until the account got suspended. But, you know, it's, it's just, you know, stuff like that to cause small disruptions. Now, um, the biggest disrupt disruption or the biggest media attention we've got so far, um, and that is probably most famous for the Hedonist International, was uh, the curious case of Dr. Gutenberg. Now, how much do I have to tell about Dr. Gutenberg anymore? I don't know how, how many people are... Not German here. Okay, well, so it's going to be 16 minutes, not 15. No, he was our Minister of Defense, actually. Well, so yeah, you might mix those up, but um, yeah, he was the Minister of Defense. And it um, turns out that he plagiarized uh, basically his whole doctoral thesis, like 80% of it or 90% of it were actually copied from other people's uh, work. And there was a big um, um, online movement um, crowdsourcing the finding of, of, of pieces of information or basically pages of information that he had stolen without any changes from other people. So suddenly uh, people said, well, you, you plagiarized your thesis and you, you betrayed. So, and he said, well, you know, that's absurd. Um, but, um, you know, turns out he couldn't really, uh, you know, when you're talking about 80% plagiarism in your thesis, there's not a lot, um, you know, there's not a lot you can do but actually resign after a couple of weeks. So, so the guy resigned and, I mean, that, that was probably the good thing to happen. But suddenly there was a, a Facebook page um, asking for his, for his reinstatement. And um, suddenly this, this page had actually something like 500 thousand followers or whatever your friends or likers or whatever you call this on Facebook and they this number rise by the second and it was really um, quite obvious that you know something was wrong there you know there was never there had never been a Facebook like page with with that many uh, like us um, and then suddenly, you know, this, this already gained a lot of media attention, you know, like, you know, the, the, the internet that had first, um, you know, found all this, this plagiarism in his, in his thesis was suddenly asking for his reinstatement. Um, and then they were calling for demonstrations in um, 20 different uh, cities of, of Germany. It was really like... And we didn't know what, what, what was going to happen. And we already, we already saw this, this like, like the Tahir Square demonstration uh, to, for, to reinstate the defense minister. So we had a, a liar and betrayer who was celebrated by the media as a martyr. And uh, of course, what, as a responsible citizen, we had to find a way to, to prevent his, his comeback into politics. Um, the problem was with his res resignation, we could not attack him anymore, right? He had, he had uh, drawn the consequences. So what would we do? Um, yeah, of course, we had to attack his fans. We had to attack those people that were demonstrating for his reinstatement. And that's when we founded the Monaco Hedonistic Front uh, that gave itself the name In Initiative Pro Gutenberg. Um, so we were planning to... to to ridicule those demonstrations, but then we found out that they um, had not 
um, officially been registered yet. So the, so the Berlin demonstration for the reinstatement of, of the former defense minister was not registered yet. yet. You have to register a demonstration in Germany. Um, so I registered the demonstration, although I was clearly an opposer of, of this idea. Right? So, um, and then on the next day I, I had to dress up like, a, like a somebody who would actually uh, register such a demonstration. Um, and we, we actually uh, did this at directly at the Brandenburg Gate. Right. So, um, and I really could we turn down the light for a second because now the pictures are really, um, really interesting for, for this part. Um, so, we were actually against his reinstatement. We were trying to ridicule the demonstration, but we were the ones who had registered the demonstration. So, um, if, you, if there is a demonstration, of course, the police is trying to keep uh, counter-protesters away. But I was the one to tell the police whom to take away and whom, whom to... <laughs> so, so you see where this is going. Um, so these are uh, some uh, probably people that believed our call and actually believed in, in Gutenberg. <laughs> we had something like 150 people there at the Brandenburg Gate and, um, you know, some people like, like him. <laughs> And then there was uh, people with very funny slogans, um, all written in the same handwriting, um, asking for his reinstatement as a chancellor, Caesar, king, you name it, asking for press censorship, um, uh, monarchy, um, all kinds of just, just crazy, stupid stuff, right? Um, so we had a lot of these, uh, these, uh, these signs, and then we, we started giving them to, to other people that came there. Um, um, so, 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 and they happily took them, you know, put up, put up the sign, you know. Like, and it was really not clear anymore whether this woman... <laughs> you, know, you, you just don't know whether... And it, nobody knew anymore. It was really like mayhem, you know. Uh, actually, this one was uh, legally uh, not tolerable. It's asking for a military um, takeover. <laughs> <laughs> but there were also people, now only the Germans are going to recognize this, but the, the guy on the right was not one of the hedonists. And he, he, he could also not be separated from us because their slogans actually were that stupid. So um, while we were doing this, the police came up to me and said, well, um, you know... Uh, uh, you have to get those counter-protesters away. We, 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 we send them away and we give, we give them a fine. And I said, why are you disturbing my demonstration? And the police said, well, um, they are ridiculing you. And I, I said, <laughs> and I, I said uh, no, 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 no. Uh, they, they are asking for uh, the reinstatement as uh, Caesar. And they said, yeah, well, that's, that's ironic. And I said, well, but it's, it's pro-Gutenberg uh, and uh, I cannot tell people... Um, how to protest. I can, I, I, can, I can tell them what to protest for, but not how. Um, so I gave them a little lesson in democracy. Which, uh, and they were really, um, it, was, it was awful because they were, they were, they were really um, caring. And they say, listen, I'm going to explain to you. Those are left-wing activists. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, no, 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 uh, we're, we're, you know, we're, we have a broad consensus, you know, this, uh, there's no left or right wing, there's a broad movement here for, for the reinstatement. Okay, so, so very, very beautiful thing. Um, my favorite, um, well, it's, it's hard to say, or, or it's, it's stupid to say it's my favorite. This is the, the one that I brought. The, it was a three by uh, one and a half meter uh, sign uh, asking for solidarity with the commander in chief. And solidarity here is written wrong, has a typo in there, just, just to make you look really, really stupid. Has this, this Nazi-like font um, that basically discredits whoever holds the sign. Uh, it's actually the, the, the ACDC typeface, though. Um, <laughs> as uh, Mr. Gutenberg once uh, made it a PR event that he visited an ACDC concert. So this is really, you know, this, this one is deep, I, I believe. <laughs> so, um, and it's, um, when we did this, we didn't know how many people would be there. Like, you know, there could have been a thousand people and they might have actually, you know, attacked us. So, but this one was for, uh, we, we, had, we had this sign just in, to, to walk in front of the demonstration so nobody would see it. 
but you know, walk behind it. And any photographer of the media would have taken the picture of this sign with a typo in there and Nazi uh, stuff. So um, we didn't really need to uh, use this one, but we made the uh, front page of basically any website and also printed uh, newspapers with this thing. So what have we learned from, from this? Um, <laughs> you really have to... Um, create situations that are unmasking, disruptive and funny. And I think the most important part of this was you don't claim responsibility and you don't explain. You just do it. You just cause the event and, and leave, leave the chaos there. And um, that's, that's, basically, that's basically what I've learned from from this, this type of activism. Now, for the question of sustainability, um, we do this because it's fun, right? So, so you know, a lot of, lot of things that we, we plan don't work out. Um, in the case of Gutenberg, I personally believe that we have played a role in at least delaying his comeback uh, solely by ridiculing the situation of, of you know, there was, no, there was no rational argument for uh, for getting the getting a liar and betrayer back into the government, there was no rational arg argument, so it was actually uh, easy prey for uh, for uh, for a media hacker. Um, I don't know what's what's going to happen next, and I don't I don't know uh, if he's ever going to come back. He's prob definitely going to try to, and we're going to see how sustainable uh, this this thing was that we did there. Uh, if you want to see more about uh, Hedonist International, we had a like I said, a big presentation at the 28C3, Chaos Communication Congress. Uh, if you Google Politik Hacken, you're going to see uh, this talk. And if you really want to do more, learn more about our theory, visit the Third World Congress of the Hedonist International, uh, May 31st to June 4th, uh, will take place uh, in this, somewhere between uh, Greifswald, Hamburg, and Berlin. We'll announce the location in a couple of days. So maybe one, just one follow-up question to, to Alexander for, for this uh, yeah. lively presentation to, uh, to link it back also to our discussion about networks and kind of how you sustain yourselves in, in reality. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of tempted to, to propose that the naked people should also wear masks because this is kind oh, of they the do, second they do. Uh, big joker for, for attention and we see it with an anonymous. So. That would be an interesting discussion, but um, maybe you you can uh, get a little bit more into what the Hedonist International as an organization is and how it works. Yeah. Because you link up this uh, basic idea of individual pleasure and like carnivalesque and ridiculing strategies and kind of a non hierarchic and non-structured approach with it seems like very pointed uh, actions and and you also have. Uh, you, you actually have a political agenda, like calling when you go on the website, you see that the Hedonist International is for the condition-free basic income and things like that. Can you maybe Are say how, <laughs> <laughs> um, how that works? Yeah, well, the way that Hedonist International is organized resembles a lot to um, how Anonymous is organized. Um, it's a decentral cluster of sections and anybody can found a section and do something under the label of Hedonist International. There's no process as becoming a member or being kicked out or whatever. Uh, you just found a section. So that's why I just mentioned the uh, Monaco Hedonistic Front that was founded for this, for this, one, uh, for this one thing we did. Um, so you could con I, I think that the, the best term for this is a duocracy. Whoever does something, does it and, and, and is right. You know, those who don't do stuff are wrong in, in the terms of, of the agreement that we've, we've done. They, they cannot protest or <laughs> against what the others do. So it's a, it's a label that anybody can take. Um, we're still waiting for the day that, you know, some Nazis found a hedonistic, a nationalistic section, and, uh, but they seem to not have done this yet. But um, yeah, anybody, f you know, you found a section, it's just a loose, um, loose cluster of people. And I, for myself, if, if, if I see something that I want to do, 
I have the people or I know whom I need to call for this. Um, and it's different people every time, maybe. And it's, you know, every once in a while somebody says, no, I'm not, I'm not in for this one. So, so you just get somebody else. But Headedness International for itself is just a label that anybody can put on their, um, put on their uh, disruption or party or whatever they do. You just found the section. You even get the website. You, you, you even have the space on the website to, to announce whatever you're doing. And it's international. I think we have a manifesto in 31 languages of the world. Okay, I would now um, kind of uh, transgress to Georgios uh, Papadopoulos, mm -hmm. which seems very fitting because he disturbs the symbolic economy himself, as I found out. You're probably confronted with this all the time. Like, I didn't know, but uh, there was an oppressed uh, president of the military dictatorship yeah. in Greece <laughs> who has the same name. So it's kind of uh, probably some kind of haunting uh, history. But uh, Georgios um, wanted to, to bring in some, some comments on, on his background as an economist. And we, we can already expect by that, or m the question maybe to, uh, to the presentation is about approaching uh, a critique and analysis of what what you dubbed, uh, I think, quite perfectly as a mental institution, uh, because what Georgios is, for example, uh, uh, researching on is uh, the Drachma. Uh, he has a, a Drachma project, uh, which he just presented at the last Transmediale. Um, but you have a more kind of serious I hope I don't say something wrong, but serious approach about analysis, mixing in e econom economy uh, or economic theory with psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. um, so wonder uh, kind of what your take is on, on approaches like the one of the Hedonist International, which uh, obviously claims to, to be kind of in the Greek tradition of critique. Well, um, Greek tradition. Uh, so first of all, I, I would like to, to thank everybody for being here and uh, also Alexander for his talk. And I have to maybe start with a small anecdote to say how much uh, maybe my connection to politics is related to the Hedonist International. Last year we published a book, uh, I can pass it on later, and it's my research on um, economics and psychoanalysis. And actually it was partly a matter of luck that um, I first got uh, this book in my hands uh, a few days before the previous uh, World Congress from uh, Hedonist International, and that was actually the first place I ever presented the book. So it was a world premiere for me and the book there. Actually, the graphic designer of the book is here, Nada Firfova, who did a very good job doing the book. Uh, if you want, I just pass it on. And uh, maybe I'm going to start a little bit to frame uh, my work and my relationships to politics by suggesting a bit, um, uh, uh, let's say, the economic or the psychoanalytic background of my, my politics. So, in many respects, I would, I'm very sympathetic on the Hedonist project because in, I think it, it encapsulates a promise about what I think is more interesting or more inviting in, um, um, let's say, radical or revolutionary um, approaches to, to political action. So there is a combination of fun, of um, anti-authoritarian structures, and at the same time a very practical and, uh, let's say, hands-on approach to, uh, to politics. At the same time, I have to say that um, coming from psychoanalysis, I'm also, an that was also a bit of discussion we had in the past with the hedonist also in the conference. I'm trying to problematize the relationship between enjoyment and uh, the subject. So the very, uh, let's say, maxim to suggest we just need to do what we want, we have to make it fun, somehow, let's say, obscures the difficulties to really enjoy or the somehow um, mediated the relationship to, that we have uh, to our desire. Because I think in, in a very important uh, sense, our relationship to politics is not only a relationship to enjoyment or a relationship to practice, but it's also a relationship to disappointment, depression. Exactly because I think political practice is the site of subjectivation in many respects. We have to be 
very careful on how we relate to enjoyment, how we relate to politics, because this is very much constitutive of our relationship to society. What I try to suggest in my book about economics and psychoanalysis is to claim that our relationship to economy is, uh, let's say, organized or mediated in, in different fields, in different registers, let's say. Of course, there is the level of, um, let's say, discourse or analysis or maybe rational argument that is very prominent in discussion. We hear about the myths of efficiency, growth, even equality in the marketplace. And this, these arguments are very much conductive on, of our relationship to, to the economy and how we act, how we behave, how we try to maximize, but also how we try to actualize ourselves in the process of economic um, uh, interaction, both in our uh, productive relationship through our employment and in, our, in the process of consumption, how we, we, let's say, become what we become through the commodities that we, we uh, consume. And there is a different, even more, uh, I would say, uh, cunning way that, the, that the, the economy or the market is, tries to interpolate us and, let's say, introduce us or make us partners in this economic game, and that has to do with creativity. And uh, it's very, very interesting that uh, often we try to think our, our, our disruption or our... Uh, uh, intersection to the economic system also as a way to be creative of transforming our environment or somehow we think that our politics have to be somehow constructive. We have to intervene in the process of economics or uh, political concatenations by suggesting an alternative vision about economic and political organization. And here I think there is a very interesting possibility but at the same time there is a very big danger. And I I think already by, by uttering this dilemma, uh, I, you already know what I'm talking about. The fact that we are always somehow uh, conformed, confronted or uh, interpolated by the system to be somehow creative, to, do, to propose something, we already somehow invited to participate. And participation always comes with the danger of being co-opted and let's say to create value of the system, to be the avant-garde of the system and be more capitalist than the capitalist, exactly by proposing these possibilities of restructuring the system from an outside perspective that is al not already part of the, of the market logic. And I think there, there is a lot of added value to be realized, both from the market itself, but from ourselves. So I'm not saying that we should not be creative or active or participating because that we will necessarily be co-opted, but what I'm trying to suggest is that exactly because there is this space of unactualized possibility that is both inside and outside the system, we have to be careful to set the rules and to get as much political momentum from it as we can rather than to be already and immediately co-opted by the system. And what I find very interesting in the strategies of Hedonists International is exactly because they are often very absurd or exactly because they don't want to claim the authorship or the property of these actions, they resist the very logic of the system that interpolates them as political activists. So by, by failing to accept uh, uh, or to accept the position of a political counterpart or a political um, interlocutor of the, of the market, of the police even, of the state, Exactly, they resist the very logic of reappropriation that the system has in place towards more traditional political activities. And I think there is a very interesting tension that we have to find a way to balance. So the idea to be both creative and disruptive without being uh, ready to be co-opted by the system. So I'm trying to allude... I think I made this point already a few times, so I'm, not, I'm gonna continue a bit further. A different thing that I believe is very important in the practice of Hedonist International, but also in radical politics today, and has to, let's say, an important added value, or it's a point to give a certain thought when we talk about disruption, has to do exactly with the uh, dynamics of enjoyment. And I think this is quite central in the Hedonist International, even in the 
in the title, but also other radical practices, ad busters comes to mind, or the clown army in, the, in England, but also uh, uh, now around the world. The idea of how, let's say, to short circuit the system, uh, the system's ability to tap on our enjoyment, to tap on our pleasure in order to make us complicit or to integrate us in a system. So we have to find ways to, on the one hand, renegotiate our relationship to desire and enjoyment through different channels than the ones that the economy offers to us, basically commodification, production, but also creativity. But at the same time, we have to sustain this politics of desire because exactly th that's what makes politics interesting, what makes participation of their important, that people are very much invested in political practice through their enjoyment and through the desire. Okay. Thank you already. Um, Also, maybe the same question to you as to Alexander, because you, you now had the advantage of commenting on Alexander or the Hedonist International's practices, but maybe you can give some ideas about <coughs> your projects and how you, how you work with uh, those approaches you just sketched. But I, I found, for example, which would be like maybe an interesting uh, thing to discuss that with the Drachma project, you did a symposium at the Historical Archive of the National Bank of Greece, which probably uh, the Hedonist International would welcome very much to have uh, have uh, access to that space. But uh, c can you maybe uh, give us some ideas on, on on how you how you realize your your critical approach in, in your own projects, and ma maybe also what the role is of linking up your your background on working on the mental institution in Greece and criticizing them with, uh, with like your residences here in Berlin and these kind of international networks, which of course the, the Hedonist International, for example, is. Like, uh, to what extent are you yourself part of those international networks? Well, uh, I would say that uh, Greece is a big mental institution as we speak. And that doesn't have to do with um, the fact that Greece are, uh, Greeks are um, um, uh, by nature crazy or maybe lazy, but by the fact that this economic disruption has a very important, um, uh, let's say, effect on the psychology of the people. And that doesn't have to do just with not having the means to get by every day, but more with this somehow increased anxiety, exactly because the situation is totally no, not as it was. So this kind of collapse has created a very peculiar um, um, uh, psychological state to the people. And I think that's maybe the site or the locus or what I'm interested in most when I'm trying to do politics or when I'm trying to do theory. So I'm trying to find ways to tap exactly in this or to create these conditions of confusion or uh, let's say, uh, I wouldn't say stress, but these states of question where things the relationship between politics, aesthetics, and theory are not so clearly defined. And by that, I want to create a space for thought, a space for thought for my readers or for my listeners. And that's why I'm trying to use this mixed strategy of uh, text and uh, sometimes um, visual arts. And I don't know if some of you looked at the book. And the whole idea of the book is that I'm a, uh, parallel to the um, theoretical argument, there is a Victorian narrative uh, comprised by artworks. And exactly the idea is to uh, use visual material next to language in order to go beyond this very rational uh, negotiation or conversation with the reader and try to tap to this space between desire and argument in order to put my, my, my argument a little bit further. And the same is done in the Drachma project. The Drachma project was an idea to speculate on a, on a, let's say, alternative currency in Greece in this pa particular situation of financial collapse, and also to a bit to provoke the discussion about uh, economics, the relations of, of Greece with the European Union, with Germany, and I think there is a very uncanny uh, feeling of doing the Dragma project in Berlin. 
And um, but the thing is that also we were kind of serious about it. So we were trying to do it nicely, and also we were trying to think about currency in a way that is not just a prank, but also to let's say think how the drachma was developed, how there is a whole narrative of. Uh, national identity and economic value constructed and how is the more uh, successful way to disrupt that. And what I think it's very interesting in this kind of strategies that are a bit more disruptive or they try to uncover this perverse logic that you were mentioning is, is that you have to do it a bit consequently. So in order to really disrupt and really manifest the insanity of the political discourse, you have to be somehow serious about it and really f try to find the uh, the points where this discourse is really completely mud and maddening and find interesting strategies to communicate that. And I think that that's always my, my, my purpose when I did the book or the Drachma project or when I do politics, but sometimes not so successful, but this is the motivation. Yeah, I think we can open up the discussion. I think like the last point to, to, to me after the two presentations, I think one very interesting question would be the relation of disruption to the background where you're situated in, because it seems that you just said it kind of plainly that in, in the Greece situation of bankruptcy, collapse, like a serious approach suddenly is what, what maybe disrupts productively while uh, the hedonist international, obviously at least in the German context, deals with a very seemingly stable situation and there this kind of uh, carnivalesque disruption maybe works rather or a question maybe would be would the hedonist international work in a, in a Greek setting at, at the moment for example or how, what would they do? Um, I cannot say what the hedonist international would do or probably can't even say I mean I cannot speak for hedonist international at all I can only speak for myself and I think what uh, you just said, it's very, very much situation dependent. And it, whether what you do works or not might be um, a matter of hours to really find the right, uh, the right time to, to do it. Um, a lot of things that we've done um, did not work out. Um, and um, some others that, that we didn't really like uh, where where big uh, big media uh, attention, um, so. But I would say as a um, as a, I would hold the the statement that you can always work with these um, strategies no matter how serious the situation is. Um, so I would say I cannot say how the hedonist international would react in in a situation that we have in Greece or how we would react or what or whoever would want to apply these strategies, but I am sure that there is a way to apply them and that it would be successful. I think it's always um, unless you're talking, you know, fascist regime. Um, I think we all all that we, we all that I talked about is limited to Western societies. Uh, when we talk to activists from, um, say, uh, Egypt, Iran, Tunisia, um, you know, they they cannot do media hacking because they don't even have uh, any anything close to free press that would you know that would. And we are always playing the press. You know, actually, we're hacking the press. We're, we're hacking the press, and we're hacking public attention. So um, if, if, if public attention and public opinion is, is controlled to an extent that doesn't give you a chance anymore, um, I mean, you can, you can hunger to death and nobody's going to care. So um, you need a free press. And as long as you have that, I think you're, you can apply strategies of media and politic hacking. Okay. Um. Yeah, I wanted uh, also to connect to your reflection <coughs> about the cooptation, because I think, uh, um, um, I would say the idea uh, of cooptation in politics, I would really connect more to the idea of resistance. And I think uh, when you speak about resistance, uh, it's really different uh, of when you speak about uh, disruption. So for example, I see disruption as more a strategy to intervene from within. So I would say in this sense, the hedonists, I think they're really trying to do 
at least from my point of view, more uh, disruption than resistance because they are also trying to hack the mechanism from within of the system. Instead, when you are doing a, a sort of resistance, I think you are having an oppositional approach that somehow is more uh, yeah, external and frontal. No? So I think it's a really different political strategy. So I would say in this sense, maybe they are even hacking the idea of cooptation because uh, since you are not opposing anymore, then you, you are really difficult to, to be co-opted because uh, also you are playing with symbols and you are playing really with uh, uh, something that is uh, structured in a way that then could be assimilated because uh, I would say also in the strategy, political strategy you have, then they result in confusion as well. So you don't know anymore who is doing what and how you should react. And that is, I think this could be really a strategic hack for uh, avoiding the idea of being co-opted. Maybe we collect because of time. I think we, we have to move some of the discussion into the break, but we should collect as many voices as possible. So. No, just like a little input because we're talking about strategies here where I would like to make the difference between actually tactics and strategies because I mean we have this old tradition of situationists and we have of course AAA in France but also in Germany has a big tradition since the communication guerrilla of course. I mean many of these kind of over information tactics are used for that one and I think the big difference is that in the 90s there was this big standpoint about media hacks and of course the, the big like heroes here, the yes men in some way, that they talked about media stunts all the time. And they actually changed their tactics to strategies three years ago. So they say they're not doing media stunts anymore, but they're doing real kind of um, organizational politics again. So back to the, let's say, traditional form of politics. And I think it's not about only how you get into it or if you kind of infiltrate the system, but it's really about how you can fight for symbolical, but also for real spaces. And if you don't link up the fight, like these tactics, to a strategy, what's the fight about, you can lose it. And that's why the situation is always like about the locality where you are. And that's why it makes it different if you are in Greece or in Germany. But even in Egypt, I would say, there's a lot of media hacking also going on. Yeah, I was going to say, actually, in half dictatorships or even dictatorships, if you media hacking works. In Ukraine, you have Femen, the women's rights yeah. group. There's now a Femen Tunisia. Uh, w uh, since... The yeah, Greece, I think, uh, a lot of resentment in Greece is that a loss of sovereignty to Berlin, to Frankfurt, to Brussels. Well, uh, we're in Berlin. Uh, what could we do to disrupt the system here, uh, to perhaps the benefit of Greece or the Greek people? Benefit or to the, in other words, uh, the to the benefit. And then, there were, in other words, uh, so actions can be done in Greece, but if if Athens no longer controls its own sovereignty, uh, what effect do they have? And perhaps that sovereignty, uh, part of that sovereignty is now here in Berlin. What can be done here? Yeah, but I don't know. Um, I think these were kind of three questions. Yeah, does it fit? Or otherwise, I would just let them answer this and round the and then take you in. OK. Do you want to start? Or um, no, since we don't have that much time, I say uh, you, you, can, you can start. <laughs> okay. Um, there is something very important on what Tatiana said about disruption as a tactic and uh, then resistance. Uh, because in some way it's very important to, to think what the target of, pol of your political intervention is. At the same time, what I would say is also very important that even a strategy of disruption could be co-opted in the sense that or maybe not co-opted, but somehow can be brushed aside from the, mama, uh, the process of the reproduction of the system in the sense that whenever there is a moment where value is created or dominance is somehow in instituted, and I think that's the very important political moment, it's often the case that our ac actions can be, let's say, uh, used by the system in order to reproduce it itself and maybe I could say that even an action so successful as the naked media uh, naked um, uh, uh, flood viewing could be also kind of a possibility to also hype this very apartment that you have to uh, you're trying not to or not to sell or to suggest a question about let's say housing in Berlin so I don't think that per se disruption is immune to 
let's say, not co-optation, but somehow manipulation by the system, but there is a clear distinction, and I think it's very interesting for the, at least both for the theoretical, but also the practical um, um, uh, analysis to keep that distinction in mind. So it was very well taken point. About what can happen in Berlin uh, to support Greece, I don't know, it's somehow I think it's, even though uh, the Greek sovereignty is something of um, uh, a phantom now, I think there is not so much that the people in Germany can do directly to, let's say, help the people of, of Greece. Maybe they can vote for a different government, which will be very helpful, if I think, in a European level. But I think it's very, very interesting to see not so much how, let's say, irrelevant political resistance in Greece is in the central context, but how irrelevant state policies have become in this new context. And this has to do with the technologies that you, you were suggesting before, and this somehow nation, nation states or even national um, um, economies have become something of um, uh, useless categories that only somehow cloud our epistemological analysis. I think it's a very different kind of politics that we have to look now, and I don't think that um, um, either the government of Greece or the government of, of uh, of Germany can do so much about changing it. Because uh, I think your your world is more moral than a comment than, than, than a question, right? And I no, think, right. yeah. Mm. But so. Um, I, I don't, if, if we're really talking about the situation in Greece now or uh, financial crisis, um, uh, I think there's another limitation that you have to set to the idea of disruptive events, and that is um, even if we not, don't really communicate uh, what we think would be right to do, um, there is at least something we have in mind. Uh, concerning the financial crisis, I lack the knowledge, actually, and the understanding just like everybody else in the world <laughs> to um, really, uh, you know, get this one to, to a sensible um, sensible um, solution or whatever uh, needs to be done there. I, do, I don't know. Uh, so so we, I don't think we have, we've done anything on financial crisis uh, so far. It's, it's usually um, mindsets that we, that we criticize. Um, not that much um, concrete things, concrete... Um, uh, decisions. Uh, I mean, we, we t they are always the reason that we do something, but but it's usually about a mindset. Um, famine. Um, I I really uh, like what they're doing, and we we also have contact with them. Um, but um, but I wouldn't say that. It, I mean, it is media hacking. Um, but it is, uh, as I said in my short presentation, you know, nakedness always works. That, that one always works. And it's really hard uh, for them to, to beat you up while you're naked. So, so they, they're just a, a proof. But something like the Gutenberg thing, I don't know. I mean... Yeah. 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 And they had a, I mean, Angela Merkel's movement is really interesting in one of her moves, which is just when uh, the image was used to bring the entire movement back into the uh, Bill Zeitung. Uh, so, so, just because it was on the microphone, so we were talking about how the Bild Zeitung uh, defined German opinion and politics about uh, the reaction to, the, to Greece um, and how to deal with the situation there. Yeah. And we might have, you might try to, to hack them. Good luck. <laughs> Is there time? Um, I, I wanted to share this insight, and maybe I can turn it into a question, but I, I was uh, uh, really fortunate to have caught the premiere of a new film about Schlingensief for the opening of Theatertreffen, and he's like kind of one of the German masters of prank, pranksterism and culture jamming. And... In this film, it mostly focused on on his his work in in Africa in Burkina Faso, and it's really inspiring because I think he 
he moved beyond this kind of culture jam, which is just just a fight with the spectacle or just with the media, which doesn't really often gain us much territory. And like Clemens said, with locality or something, it really makes a difference when it it plays a role in something that's very tangible. And basically what Schlingensief did in Burkina Faso was he kind of fabricated the story of making a, a, an opera house in Africa, which is very absurd. Maybe he's he's being sincere about that as well, of bringing like art art forms to to Africa. But in the end, what what really happened was he was able to to pull a kind of prank where he generated all this money uh, from maybe NGOs or whatever, and and they're actually building a whole village with schools and things like that. So it became extremely concrete for what Burkina Faso needed. And whether the opera house ever gets built, it's almost irrelevant because his jam completely worked to bring resources to to the people who needed it there. And so I think it's useful to think of like how to how to play with the jam to steal resources from it. And, and the economic field is certainly very ripe for this, how we can steal the resources back into our communities and jam it in a way that's very concrete for us to to utilize what comes out of the out of the prank. Sometimes we don't win any territory out of out of uh, making media spectacle. So I just wanted to add that. Maybe you all can elaborate on that further. Thanks. Um, I think we have to kind of uh, put this input into the overall process of building resource and building on this network. And um, I think one insight at least I got from, from this discussion is I think one, one thing we should also think about is um, remember the situation when Alexander asked how many people from Germany are in this room? I, th I mean, we have an international situation now and we have it in this room and all, all we are doing with linking these networks of networks is basically getting beyond this these national frameworks and I think the, the discussion we had on, on, on Greece and Bild Zeitung and the difficulties and maybe the resources we have points to a need that we really kind of confront the situation of how do we counter a situation where Europe is kind of defined in terms of financial resources and still kind of played in this uh, old frameworks of, of publics, of defined publics and of national states, which are somehow in, in reality irrelevant to, to a lot of our realities and maybe even on the political level. And I think to, f to formulate a strategy out of our knowledge and approaches which goes beyond our kind of local and, and national settings will be something for future discussions. And I thank you for opening up this uh, in a disruptive but con constructive way. And um, we are now doing a break for 15 minutes. minutes. And then Tatiana would be very happy to see everybody back here. <laughs>